Today, I'm going to talk about momentum and show how to solve physics problems using the conservation of momentum. So momentum which we represent with the lowercase p is defined as the mass times the velocity of an object. And so velocity is a vector, so momentum is also a vector. Uh, one application or one place where momentum pops up that we've already seen is that force is actually the time derivative of momentum. And so this has the consequence that if you do this integral, not only do you get the MA term, but you also get an added change in mass term. So and this change in mass term is what governs something like rockets. You propel it, you make a force by pushing mass, by losing mass, basically. So that's just one place where momentum pops up, uh, but there are certainly others. And one of the most important aspects about momentum is that it is a conserved quantity in physics. So, <clears throat> of momentum. And again, this is, we don't quite have the tools yet to show why momentum is conserved, but we will later in the class as we go. Uh, and then we'll, once we have those tools, we'll derive the conservation of momentum. So just like conservation of energy, conservation of momentum just says that whatever momentum you start with has to be the momentum that you end with. And where this is useful for solving physics problems is in collisions. And in physics, there are two types of collisions. There are elastic, which you can think of as something hitting something else and then bouncing off of that thing. And inelastic, where some two things hit each other and then they stick together. So an example of an elastic collision would be like a tennis ball bouncing off of a wall or being hit with a racket, or a baseball being hit with a baseball bat. Um, and then an example of hit and stick would be uh, like those game shows where you're wearing a Velcro suit and you try to jump into, jump out a wall and make yourself stick. So those are the two types of collisions and no matter what type of collision you're doing, the momentum well, in our idealized physics world, whether you have an elastic or inelastic collision, the momentum is gonna be conserved. So momentum is conserved in both elastic and inelastic collisions. Okay, so now we have this idea of conservation of momentum 
We, and now let's see how we apply that to these two different types of collisions. So we'll start with just in one dimension. So we'll do so one dimensional collisions. And let's start with elastic collisions in one dimension. So our initial picture, let's say we have a cart on wheels that has some mass M1. And it is moving at some initial velocity. And it's moving towards a cart that has mass M2 that has no initial velocity. So this is our initial picture. Our final picture, mass M1 has stopped. So V1 final is zero and mass M2 is now moving at some final velocity, V2 final. So let's say we knew what the initial velocity of mass one was. Now, how can we find what the final velocity of block two is? So to do that, we can use our conservation of momentum. So if we look at the left side picture, the we have two objects, so they could both have momentum. So let's just write it all out. M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial. And then again, at the end, we still have two masses and they could both have some final velocity. Now, because of how we've set up the problem, we know that there is no initial velocity for mass two and there's no final velocity for mass one. So if we wanted to solve now for the final velocity of mass two, we can do that pretty simply algebraically, just divide mass two to the other side. So this is this would be our final answer. Okay, so that was a 1D elastic collision. So now let's look at a 1D inelastic collision. Okay, so again, we'll have our initial picture and we'll start with Again, mass one moving at some initial velocity and we'll have mass two start at rest again. And for our final picture, mass, when mass one hits mass two, they're gonna become stuck together and they'll be moving with some final velocity. And we wanna figure out what that final velocity is. So again, we can use conservation of momentum. So initially mass one, again, we'll, we'll write it all out. So the momentum for block one, this M1 V1 initial, the momentum for block two would be M2 V2 initial. And then at the end, 
they're both moving at the same velocity. So we could write them out separately, m1 v final plus m2 v final. But then we could just factor out the v final and it would be m1 plus m2 times v final. The initial velocity of block two is zero. So this term cancels or goes to zero. And then if we wanted to solve for the final velocity, we could just divide both sides by m1 plus m2. And we would get that the final velocity is m1 over m1 plus m2 times the initial velocity of block one. And so that would be our final velocity. So this was all um, collisions in one dimension, but you can also have collisions in two or three dimensions. So let's see what Let's see an example of a 2D and we'll do an inelastic collision. Okay, so for this one, we'll have our initial picture and we'll have a ball. So let's pretend we're playing pool or something. And we've got the cue ball here. And we've got the ball that we want to hit here. So we'll call the cue ball M1. And we'll call the ball that we want to hit M2. So to get our cue ball to the other ball, we need to go up at some angle theta, one initial. And let's say that we knew the initial velocity of how hard we hit the ball, V1 initial. <clears throat> then for our final picture, now we're going to have mass 2. Let's say that the mass 2 was sitting near the side pocket, and we wanted to hit it into that side pocket, so we need its final velocity be in this direction, v2 final. And we don't know what that is. And then after mass one hit mass two, it, oh, this is a, this is an elastic, not an inelastic collision. So once the ball hit, once mass M1 hit M2, it went off at some angle theta 2 final or theta 1 final up here. At some final velocity V1 final. So let's say given the initial velocity the initial angle of the initial velocity both the masses 
and the final angle we want to find the final velocity of both balls. Okay, so this is a collision, so we're going to end up using conservation of momentum. And the only wrinkle here is that now because we're working in two dimensions and because momentum is a vector, <clears throat> we can have two linearly independent equations. So if we started with conservation of momentum, momentum initial equals momentum final, we can break that into x and y components. So now the initial momentum in the x direction has to equal the final momentum in the x direction. And the initial momentum in the y direction has to equal the final momentum in the y direction. Okay, so if we go back and look at our picture, in the initial picture, our only momentum will come from mass one, and mass one had a velocity in both the x and the y direction. So let's break mass one, V one, initial, let's break that into components. So it was at some initial angle theta one initial. So the X component would be, so V one initial X is V one initial and then x component is going to be cosine of theta one initial and the y component v one initial y v one initial sine of theta one initial. Okay, and then the for the final picture, the final velocity of mass two is only in the x direction, so we don't need to break that one into components. And then the final velocity for mass one, we're gonna have to break that into components. So M2 has this, or sorry, this is M1. as this final velocity at this angle theta, theta one final. So again, we can break those components up and we'll get that the initial or the V one final in the X direction is V one final and then x will be cosine again, theta one final, v one final y, v one final, sine theta one final. Okay, so if we wanted to make these vectors, then this x component would be negative but then all the other components would be positive. Okay, so let's take all those components that we had and start plugging them into our X and Y equations. So in the initial picture, our X momentum was only this V1 X, V1 initial X. So we have M1, V1 initial X. And there is no 
Um, there is no momentum for mass two initially. And then the final momentum in the X direction will again have our M1 B1 final X plus our M2 B2 final. Okay, so if we plug in the trig functions that we did, we get V1 initial X cosine of theta one initial equals M1 V1 final X. I guess we can get rid of this X subscript. So V1 initial and V1 final. Cosine of theta one final plus M2 V2 final. So we'll remember that this momentum was pointing to the left, so that'll get a minus sign. So we were trying to find V1 final and V2 final. So if we look at this equation, we have both of those things, but you can't solve for two unknowns using one equation. So we need another equation. And we can do that by going in the y direction. So in the y direction, so again, for the initial side, there was only momentum related to mass one. So mass one, V one initial Y equals, and then at the end, there was no Y component to mass two's uh, momentum. So we'll just have M1 V one final Y. And then if we plug in our trig functions, we get this. This should have been sine, sine. So from in the x direction, so from p initial x equals p final x, we had M1 V1 initial cosine of theta one initial equals M1 V1 final cosine of theta one final. And this was in the negative direction plus M2 V2 final. And now we're plugging the term that we found for V1 final in, we get negative M1 times V1 initial sine of theta one initial sine. times cosine of theta one final plus M two V two final. And so if you wanted to solve this for V two final, you would move the mass one term to the other side, M one V one initial cosine theta one initial plus M one V one initial sine of theta one initial over sine theta one final 
cosine of theta one and two v two final, and then to solve for m two you or for v two you would just divide m two to the other side. So I'm also going to factor m one out of both terms on the right hand side. So we'll get m one over m two times v1 initial, and I guess we can factor out the v1 initial from both sides as well. And then we get cosine of theta1 initial plus sine of theta1 initial over sine of theta one final times cosine of theta one final. And that would be our final term. So now I've shown an example an example of an elastic collision in one dimension, an elastic collision in two dimensions and an inelastic collision in one dimension. So I'll show a more complicated problem in a future video where we do another two dimensional collision, uh, but we'll start with fewer unknowns and we'll use conservation of energy in tandem with conservation of momentum to solve the problem. This has been a Dr. Strassbau lecture. Keep the credentials. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.